Uh, so, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, today's Sustainable Futures seminar. Uh, my name is Mike Shaver. I'm Director of Sustainable Futures uh, and uh, Professor of Polymer Science. Um, but really today is uh, sort of our continuing effort to showcase uh, both the depth and breadth of our expertise in how we can tackle environmentally uh, important challenges through sustainable solutions. Uh, and to do today, we've got uh, two really cool uh, speakers talking about very, very different things. Um, uh, first up is uh, Claudia Henninger. Uh, she's senior lecturer in fashion marketing management in the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about going in circles, uh, which uh, will delve into the opportunities and drawbacks of going circular in the fashion industry. Over to you, Claudia. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm just going to share my screen. So thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to try to make it um, hopefully as engaging as possible, taking you on a little bit of a journey through the fashion industry. Um, I like the title um, because I sort of like feel it's slightly ironic um, since we talk about the circular economy um, and whether or not things are actually going in circles and we can actually achieve circularity. So just a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, am very passionate about sustainability, uh, fashion as a context, and I'm specifically interested in collaborative consumption. So on a little diagram on the left hand side, you can see everything that is sort of like in the yellow boxes is something that I'm very passionate about. So anything from making your own garments to upcycling, uh, renting, swapping, uh, repair cafes, all of these different aspects of things that I'm very fascinated about and that I will also talk a little bit more uh, within this presentation. In terms of the background, so why the fashion context, I think it's quite important to actually talk about fashion because it's not something that just concerns one person but it's actually everyone since we're all getting up in the morning we're getting dressed. It's also one of uh, a very high contributing economy in itself so the annual expenditure on closing in the UK alone in 2020 was 54 billion which is quite a lot and we've got over 555,000 people employed within the UK so again if you kind of like have a little bit of a think of how many people this, this actually are it's, it's absolutely massive but what is even bigger is the annual value of discarded clothing which is over 500 billion US dollars and that's globally um, so we're actually missing out on quite a lot of opportunity here because when we're getting, and what I mean with discarded clothes is just simply when we no longer want our clothes, they go somewhere else. And this is a massive value that not a lot of uh, companies are actually capitalizing on at the moment. Whilst it has been said, and this was uh, by the European Environmental Agency, they have highlighted that if you would extend the use of your garment by one year, you would actually reduce the annual carbon, water and waste footprint by 30%. However, one of the things that we currently don't know is if we're extending the life of our clothes by one year, does this actually mean that we would wear them for another year or does it also count if you have them in our wardrobe for another year? So again, there's quite a lot of ambiguity in there and there's a lot of room for um, investigations. In terms of the elephant in the room with COVID, um, things that we are kind of like going out of it, that one of the fascinating aspects, at least for me, that came out of COVID is that people became more and more conscious about what they're actually doing with garments. So I'm not quite sure if the audience feels exactly the same. I was certainly one of the declutterers because you suddenly had a lot more time. You could actually go into your wardrobe and sort of like see what you have in there. Sometimes you fall in love again with garments that you had in there. But on average, people have discarded 11 items during lockdown. So again, this is quite a lot. Um, probably for me, like it was slightly more. I do have, unfortunately, quite a big um, wardrobe. So even though I'm preaching sustainability, it doesn't always help. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that I find quite fascinating as well is that the demand for raw materials has tripled or will be tripled by 2050. So again, we will have a lot more garments in circulation and on the right hand side you actually see quite a fascinating um, exhibition kind of like talk, like similar to sort of like the iceberg metaphor where you sort of like see how many garments are actually discarded every single time so in the UK it's 140 million worth of clothing that are sent to landfill um, which again is not the ideal place for our garments to end up 
um, but also to have a little bit more of a perspective of it. So it's actually 29,000 London buses that are filled with um, garments. So again, it's probably quite interesting to, to sort of like have this visualization because when we say, oh, it's uh, 140 million pounds worth of clothing that being sent to landfill, it might not mean as much to us as when we actually like seeing it either as an exhibition where we, we physically can see how much um, this actually is, or we've conceptualized it. Everybody has probably been to London before. If we see those red double-decker buses, and if you got think about 29,000 of them, um, we, we do understand that there's a massive issue within the fashion industry. So when you think about what's happening at the moment, so the majority of organizations are working towards a linear economy. Um, so you basically got one line and I'm pretty sure the majority of people on, on the call uh, know about this. So you, you've got your raw materials, you're producing something out of it. You're then distributing it to your retail shops. We as consumers go in, buy it. And then we've got to the end of the life of the garment because we say either it no longer fits or we just don't fancy it anymore or it's broken. So it goes to, to waste and waste to see an apprentice is. So with the linear economy, we currently think that it is actually going into landfill. Um, and again, there's quite a lot of things that are happening all the way through. And there's a lot of impact that our garments have. So in the material side, it might any, be anything from um, pesticides to fair labor conditions. So you've got the economic issues, you've got social issues. Again, for production, there's a lot of waste, although with technology, this is probably um, being reduced more and more. Um, but still when we are cutting garments, so we normally create them by having a certain pattern and still around it, there might be a couple of off cuts, so small pieces that we can't actually use. For the retail, again, we need to send our garments from the production side to the retailer. So there's plastic packaging. Um, there's also when we are actually using it from the retailer. So before it was plastic bags, now we've got paper bags or anything else. There's also the working conditions um, in retail stores and how we treat our suppliers. Again, when we're using it, what type of detergent are we using? Are we tumble drying it? Are we dry cleaning it? Do we use the iron? Are we actually air drying it? So it's a lot of um, kind of like waste that, that happens there as well. And again, in the disposal uh, phase at the moment, there is a lot of it is going into landfill. Now, when we think about the circular economy, so you, we are actually trying to reloop our garments as much as possible. And we're seeing them more as nutrients rather than as waste. Uh, which is obviously something that is quite like for me, it's, it's very fascinating because there's a lot of different um, business models that we actually see as becoming circular. And that's why I talked about in uh, sort of like the title of my presentation. I talk more about going in circles because there's not one way solution, but it's multiple different aspects that we can actually uh, focus on. So whether or not this is more towards the end, so the consumer side, but we might be re-looping our garments through either bringing them to a charity shop or a second-hand shop, uh, or if we're renting our garments, if we attend a swap shop, so where we go with strangers and just literally exchange clothes, or is it in a, the almost like industry stage where we also might think, right, how can we actually design our garments? So when they come to the end of time, that we actually like reusing the material and how can we capture this value? So as I said before, there's 500 billion US dollars um, that are being kind of like wasted annually on, on garments that are being discarded, but you could actually use them for, for different business models. So again, there's different uh, ways. So we might think about textile recycling, and I'm sure there's people on the call who know a lot more about the chemical and technical recycling or the biorecycling. We've also got things like remanufacturing um, or product life extension. So product life extension is something that, that I'm focusing more on from a social science perspective, where I'm looking at how do people actually reuse garments. So it's from a cradle to cradle because you're trying to get as many loops in and going in circles. Um, as possible. We normally also like try to compare different um, models. So we've obviously got the linear economy where you just got the one way. We've got recycling economy where again, we've got waste at one end and ideally for the circular economy, uh, there would be no waste and that would be the ideal scenario for uh, what we wish for, for for the fashion industry. There's different principles and I'm not gonna talk too much about them, but a majority of them actually look from a, a producer type of perspective when you think about designing for longevity. 
Uh, some of you might uh, think, well, that's quite interesting, especially with fast fashion, uh, because it has been quite negatively in the press of things being discarded or when you wash them more than uh, two times, they kind of like fall apart. It's also thinking about recyclability. So again, can you actually make use of it later on? And we've also had a lot about offshoring or nearshoring. So historically speaking, we don't actually, especially in the UK, we don't really produce that many garments anymore. Prior to this, um, so before the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of uh, fashion that was being produced within the country, but now obviously it's other countries because the, uh, it depends on the cost of how much we actually uh, wanting to pay for it. So sourcing and producing locally might not necessarily be always an option, but this is something that we should think about within a circular economy. And there's also some from a consumer perspective, so it's about us, so how we are using washing and repairing our garments is also different types of when we go actually shopping or acquiring. So do we really need to buy everything or could we just rent it? This might especially be for special occasions. So if we think about, I don't know, ball gowns or anything or tuxedo, do we need, really need to own it if we just wear it once or could we actually rent it? Uh, there's also the swapping aspect. So just because we don't want it anymore, maybe somebody else finds use of it or you've got the second hand um, aspect as well and there's also the quality as opposed to quantity so maybe if we just buy one item that's very high quality we could use it also for longer rather than buying five t-shirts that fall apart within um, the next five minutes so there's obviously quite a lot of benefits and drawbacks um, all the way through of, of why we should have a circular economy uh, one of the things that also just really briefly wanted to highlight is that there's loads of different business models that are classified as being circular so it might be some that are more um, repair oriented. So again, it's about when it has already reached the consumer and what the consumer can do afterwards with it. Uh, we've also got leasing, we've got a rental, a hire model, there's uh, the closed exchange, there's also resale. So there's quite a lot of different um, areas. And one of the things that you might notice here as well is within the fashion industry, we don't really have anything that's a complete circle, but I feel we've got multiple tiny circles. So we either focus on the consumer we focus on the industry, but there's nothing that really combines all of them uh, together to really investigate what's happening here. To also give you a couple more examples of what's actually going on, and I know I talk more about the doom and gloom um, of the fashion industry, but there is actually quite a lot of uh, fun things that are happening. So first of all, I just wanted to uh, um, encourage everyone to think about, so what do you actually think about circular fashion? What does it actually mean? So is it something that's quite chic or is it more kind of like the trash couture aspect? Uh, where some people say, why would I wear anything that's circular or sustainable? It doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because it might be too much out there or just too crazy. Um, and it's also something, is it trendy or is it trash? So one of the things that I actually found quite interesting, and I do apologize, I will share quite a lot of images. Um, but one of the things that I found quite interesting is when I went to a concert and I'm a huge fan of uh, kind of like getting the memorabilia from them. And uh, this specific, from this specific band, I, I just thought it was amazing that they had this T-shirt and also the I was trash, but now I'm fashionable. Uh, so I actually thought it was quite nice. Whether or not it's really 100% recyclable materials is something that we probably should hopefully believe. Whether or not this is actually possible from a, a manufacturing perspective is a different question. So there's also, do we actually believe everything that retailers are telling us or um, do we also need to question things? And it's also um, currently we're very much encouraged to actually purchase even more. So there's a lot of shops that have something like new stuff is coming in each day. So why did you do the same and just also come in and potentially spend your money in here, which again is probably not the most sustainable way. But on the other hand, they're also trying to counterbalance this by, for example, like take back schemes. So there's a couple of companies that were quite innovative, and that's probably going more into the uh, slightly more out there. So you've got the uh, trash couture or kind of like things that are really um, interesting and creative. Uh, so Fragments Garments is one of those organizations that actually created modular fashion. And depending how you feel, you could make it either into a top, a cardigan or a dress. Uh, there's no sewing skills or anything else required. It's just literally like a puzzle piece. So if you're into jigsaws, that's probably your new type of fashion. Uh, very creative, kind of like a fun idea of what could be circular because they say, well, obviously, if you don't like it anymore, you just take it apart, make something new out of it, but you can use the individual components. There's also um, creative design is very much um, part of the circular economy. So this one was called the Versalette. 
Um, and it was designed by two travelers um, from Canada who said, if you're going traveling, we don't really want to have a lot of baggage. So they designed one piece that you can wear in 30 different ways. It's quite fascinating. If anybody wants to have the link, uh, do try and watch it. I actually counted it as well because I didn't really believe it, but it's actually 30 different ways of how you um, how you're wearing it. And again, it's quite it's quite nice whether or not the one size fits all. Again, it's a different um, question whether or not this actually works, but it is a very creative idea. Uh, we've all, like I've been in in Vienna a couple of times, but in 2016, I thought this uh, store kind of like sprung out because it was obviously the hashtag is uh, is quite interesting. Um, but one of the things that actually like that, that, is, that it says it's all about customization. It's about things being handmade and it's a perfect fit. So rather than actually going into a store where, for example, your um, jeans might not fit you 100 percent, they actually dedicated the whole business model of we make the perfect pair of jeans for you. Yeah, you pay slightly more, but at least we guarantee it's 100 percent perfect. And again, this is about slowing down. It's about being circular. And they also said if you are actually you know, like changing size, you can also come back and we can adjust it and we can make it fit again for you um, and just have a little bit more of the, uh, of the garments in there as well. Uh, we also sometimes use waste products from other organizations or from other industries. So for example, you've got the plastic bottles that could be turned into t-shirts, but we've also got uh, now nutrients from, for example, like the food industry. So uh, orange fiber has been quite popular as well. And it has also been sold in the high street where you just use waste products from other industries and make it into something that you can use for the fashion industry. And again, this is about just rethinking and sort of like having more of a paradigm shift of what can we actually use? What is our creativity? How can we actually create something that might not necessarily go into one big circle, but maybe it's interlooping circles from different industries that would make it more beneficial for different organizations. Again, there's also companies such as Freitag, um, who I was absolutely fascinated by. They uh, use truck turbulence to uh, create bags. Um, initially, it was just messenger bags for, for bike riders because they said most of the time when they're in, the, in rainy weather, everything gets soaked in there. And those ones, obviously, they repel it. And they just use, uh, like, for example, seatbelts, airbags, one bicycle, inner tubes just to make um, their bags. And if I also got a fascinating range of actual biodegradable jeans. The only thing that doesn't biodegrade is currently the uh, metal buttons, but you can um, use this for something else. And they've also tried to work with another organization just to make sure that they're actually um, interconnected and that they're um, trying to reuse as much as possible and also becoming more and more circular. In the UK, we also um, do things like the DIY movement, which is uh, quite fascinating. So we've got a lot more um, things that we can actually start doing ourselves. So almost going back to basics. And this is uh, my experience of actually creating shoes, which I had a fantastic time doing, but it's also something kind of like thinking like how, how and what we are doing. So the uh, outside of the shoe is made from a kimono that was um, being uh, like the kimonos, you can actually reuse them because they're normally um, from silky or cottony materials. But they said the uh, kind of like middle band is quite long. So it's over, I think, four meters long, but it's not very wide. So when you go to the secondhand stores, apparently in Japan, and um, there's not a lot of use for them, but obviously like for shoes and if you've got like different patterns and you don't mind that they're not exactly the same, you can use them. And there's quite creative ways um, of, of getting a new economy and a new business model going. In terms of what's happening with um, kind of like in, in the industry itself, so RAP is, is one of the um, uh, key kind of like legislation bodies as well, um, and they're looking to cut down uh, carbon and environmental impact. So again, that's why we need to look more and more at the fashion industry and what we can do in terms of recycled and recyclable materials and extending the life cycle. And we've also got um, a lot of partnerships that have gone on. So, for example, Asda and Preloft uh, Vintage Partnership. We've got Primark with a take back scheme. We've got Patagonia who used regenerated textiles like Infina. And there's quite a lot. There's even more examples. I mean, like these are just um, kind of like prominent ones. They're normally on the high street or people can see them there as well. But there's a lot of things happening in the industry. 
Um, in terms of the challenges, one of the key things, that's why I personally really like interdisciplinary research projects, is at the moment we very much look at one cycle or one circle and we're very almost like fixated on one, but we don't actually look at things in a very holistic approach because when we think about going circular, it's sometimes true that we've got the linear economy and we're trying to push something onto it um, rather than actually thinking how can we make it really circular, how can we actually go into circles and make it um, something that is worthwhile and obviously that also reduces the impact. Uh, so this is uh, kind of like a little bit of a whistle stop about going circular in the in the fashion economy. I hope it wasn't too depressing, um, but thank you very much for listening. And if anybody does have any questions, please do feel to ask. Thanks so much, Claudia. Uh, so uh, if you have questions, you can just pop them into the chat. Um, but while you're doing that, I, I figure I would start. So. I think it was a couple of days ago, there was a BBC story about Love Island buying all of their clothes from eBay. And I, I couldn't tell whether that was greenwashing or not, because they're obviously buying it and they're still only going to wear it once and then they're probably going to do something with it. So like, what what is this rise of influencers and the desire to never be seen in the same thing twice? And, and how has that sort of created new challenges for sustainable fashion it's actually quite fascinating because i think um tv shows like love island they obviously have a lot of following and there's a lot of um people who are watching it and especially like slightly younger generations probably they're also very keen and, and they aspire to be like certain people so i feel with making this move to buy second hand it will probably be um quite beneficial because then others are following the example whether or not like hopefully they're all doing it um but I also take your point with there's this unwritten rule of well obviously we can't wear things apparently twice um and be photographed in it that would be absolutely shocking uh but yeah I mean like the like renting or buying second hand would actually be one way because then you could also like again resell it afterwards or if you're renting it obviously you're not owning it so you, you could get um, exactly this like we, you could get something new and you only have it for a very short period of time so the chances that you would probably rent the same thing twice is quite minute. So uh, uh, Lucian Wong asked the question what what practical advice do you have for the consumer uh, i.e. me, so, and I would agree, <laughs> Scout for me as well, not just Lucian, uh, to recycle unwanted clothes, right? So I feel like if I go and put them in a bin, I have no idea what's going to happen to them, but knowing about plastics, I figure it's not what they say it is. So like, what what's the best fate? Uh, so Lucian asked whether to take it to a charity shop or do we put it in one of those bins or do we give it to our friends? What should we do? Uh, that's a very good question. So I think the charity shop definitely is a, is a better solution than, than putting it into landfill. Um, there is quite a lot of different things. So it depends why you might give it away or why you might want to recycle it. Like sometimes it's also quite fun to actually do little workshops like upcycling workshops. If you say I'm actually quite tired of a blouse, but if I've got, I don't know, something embroidered on it um, and I don't, currently don't have the skill set, but if I could gain them, then I can make something quite funky out of it. Um, so that's definitely a solution. The charity shops, they are a good solution. However, they're also not the best way um, to do this because I'm not quite sure in how far people are aware, but there have been reports that a lot of our things that are being donated are actually not being resold within the UK, but they are going into third world countries. And again, they're crashing the economy there. So it's also not one of the most economic ways just to move forward. Uh, but sometimes it's also quite nice to uh, um, either give them like to specific charities, like there's a couple of organizations um, who are kind of like renting them out afterwards to people who might need them um, or go into swap shops or, yeah, as you said, Mike, as well, like family and friends, they're sometimes quite good as well. Uh, so uh, Arthur Garforth asks, uh, when I was younger, Arthur, you're still young, I'm sure. Uh, I always rented my tux for the annual student balls, uh, so I know this is much more cost effective, but what's the market currently for renting, sharing clothes, and I guess we're looking at the UK, since there's no such thing as student balls uh, in Canada. 
Uh, it is relatively small, I must say. So it's a, it's very much a niche market at the moment. Um, there is not a lot of rental companies. So it's more for occasion renting. So as you highlighted, like if you want to have a tox or something, like that's relatively popular. It's also for uh, weddings with wedding dresses specifically. They're quite big or ball gowns. Um, whilst in the US, there's obviously a, a rent the runway, which probably quite a lot of people have heard about. And um, they had quite a lot of success also with more uh, casual wear. I think it's a little bit uh, dependent on the culture that you're in. So, for example, in Japan, it's also quite normal to, for example, only have your work wear because sometimes you also have to wear uniforms. But then for your spare time, you just rent something because they say well it's two days a week why would I buy those clothes if I can you know just rent the wardrobe and have somebody tell me this is currently like completely on trend just try it or get a little bit of, of styling advice but within the UK it's still relatively niche having said that the um, clothes sharing especially through swap shops is increasingly getting popular and it's something that is also quite interesting uh, in terms of urban development because normally they pop up in slightly more um, areas like that they're not like they're just being regenerated in a way and once the, the swap shops are happening there's more life coming um, and there's almost like a community forming and then you can actually see uh, a lot more happening but it's still a relatively small market and is there like are there links to like where those places are considering I can't even sew a button uh, on when it falls off like that idea of developing skills or going to swapping events and so is there something, a, a resource in terms of what's going on in Greater Manchester that you could maybe share? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, like one of the uh, organizations that I follow is Stitched Up and they've got regular kind of like workshops with um, how to customize your t-shirt, learn how to knit. Um, they've also got sewing workshops, which are quite fun or just uh, repair cafes, which I thought was absolutely fantastic where somebody uh, uh, was I think repairing a radio while somebody else was mending jeans. Um, so there's literally like everything happening. It's also quite a nice community space. It's very friendly, it's non-judgmental. Sometimes I feel, especially when you, um, well, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, sometimes it feels also quite intimidating if you think, oh, maybe I should know, but I actually don't. Um, but they're really, really friendly. And if you just type in Swap Shops Manchester, there's also uh, quite a few coming up as well. Uh, so last question for you from uh, Sammy, uh, talking about reversible clothes, uh, which I definitely remember. This was in high school. I had a reversible sweatshirt that I wore all the time. And it'd be like, you could switch it at lunchtime, right? And then that was cool because you had two outfits in the day. Um, so is there sort of any any insight in terms of the growth of that um, or or whether that'll come back? Obviously less than 20, but probably a little bit simpler. It probably does come back because everything in the fashion industry is coming back. It's, it's all again, going in circles. So at the moment, I think you've very much got the seventies with, uh, I mean, we still got loads of plastic clothes. Um, so that kind of like fits in, but with the bright sort of like neon colors and um, that has definitely come back. The eighties are also on the rise again. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't see why the reversible things are not coming back. They actually have been back for a very short while. I think about like five or six years ago. Um, but unfortunately, it's always it's just very much trend led, um, and that's one of the, the bigger things for the fashion industry. It is all about trends and kind of like returning trends. We'll we'll do one more quick one. Um, so uh, Susan uh, asks, sort of at this interface, and this is the same as the plastic field I work in it, you know, is change happening because suppliers or brands are feeling pressure or is change happening because government legislation is coming in. So how's the balance between those things? I think it's a little bit of a combination, although, um, and I'm pretty sure our other colleagues might be able to answer this a little bit better, uh, but the uh, legislation is catching on um, we've also got like the EU circular textile strategy now, but again, it's it's relatively slow and it's um, not as prescriptive because supply chains are global. So it's very hard to actually have one rule for everyone because every country and continent and everything else is very different. Uh, so I think consumers actually could have massive power 
Um, and there's obviously like a lot of activism going on with like silent um, stitches in front of um, organizations where people are just mending their clothes, not saying anything, but sort of like having a little bit of a protest. Um, so there's a lot from the consumer side that is actually coming and a lot of consumers want to see more um, sustainable um, garments. On the other hand, obviously, companies are also feeling the pressure with you have to um, have like more of an environmental, like obviously like the obligations that are um, pressured on you. You've also got your uh, charities or NGOs that are pressuring and saying you need to change something. And especially if you had negative press. Uh, you, you definitely need to do something. So I think it's a little bit of a, of a combination of all of them. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, we're going to turn it over to our second speaker uh, for today, uh, who is uh, Professor Holly Shields. Uh, Holly is from the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health. Uh, and she works both with uh, Mary uh, as well as being the Healthy Futures lead for Sustainable Futures. Uh, and she is, uh, we ended the previous talk early so I can have time to read this title. Uh, Polyaromatic hydrocarbon based cardiotoxicity and how fish health following oil spills provides sentinel information for tackling human health with air pollution. <sighs> yeah. So I'm, I do apologize to everybody for that um, excessively long title. I'll, I'll, I'll shorten it right away um, to uh, um, this. Can everybody? Yeah, can everybody... that looks great, Holly. The floor is yours. OK. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Um, let me just. Uh... OK, so apologies, everybody, for that excessively long um, title. I, I don't. I don't know if that was more what I was just thinking or just trying to give like the whole um, seminar in, in one sentence, but I've shortened it now to fishing for insights and translational cardiac physiology. Really what I want to do today is to try and share the journey I've been taking um, on moving from working in fish and oil spills and how that's given us information about air pollution and human environments. And in that way, try and highlight um, how working across disciplines can has expedited my research, but also hopefully our understanding of health issues in relation to the environment. Um, and for those who might not know me, I'm a professor of integrative physiology in the Faculty of Biology, Medicine and Health, but I'm also the Sustainable Futures Challenge Lead for Healthy Futures. So I'm happy to answer questions about that in addition to my talk at the, at the end. So let me just um, go to the pointers. Okay. So um, let's go to uh, health. So I'm sure everybody knows the air pollution is bad um, and we know it's bad for our health. But what you might not know is that it's considered the third largest risk factor globally for um, causes of death, leading to about 7 million premature deaths each year. And that um, puts us right here in this, this index, just below smoking and high blood pressure, the, one of the largest risk factors associated with, with human death. So we know air pollution is high and is causing death. But another way to think of it is, is to know that it's not equally um, high across the globe. So there's areas where air pollution is even higher or different, different levels. And so you can think about the impact of air pollution on health by asking how many years would you gain if air pollution in where you live met the current um, World Health Organization um, air pollution standards. And you can see it's not, not the same. If we're here in, in England, maybe we'd gain um, a, a couple of months, but in parts of the world, like Nigeria and parts of India, it's in excess of um, seven years. So really, um, there's, uh, it's not only, and that's considering just the impact of air pollution on, on, on death, but that doesn't even consider the impact of air pollution on morbidity and um, uh, quality of life across populations. So air pollution affects our health. But what we might not know is that the main way it's affecting our health is really by impacting our hearts. And you can see here that um, there's a high percentage of those 7 million deaths are associated to ischemic heart disease or aspects of the cardiovascular system. And we know that there's been associations between air pollution and aspects of cardiovascular disease for a long time from the epidemiological literature, including ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, strokes, myocardial infarction or heart attacks. And it's important to know that these cardiac impairments are associated with not just long-term exposure to um, low levels of air pollution, which they are, 
but also increase with spikes in air pollution in any given environment. So I think it's fair to say then that air pollution is affecting our health by affecting our hearts. So what do I mean by, by air pollution? Well, air pollution is a complex mixture that's formed by the combustion of fossil fuels. You can see it's composed of gases, liquids, and particles. As the particles that tend to get the most um, attention, we hear things, we hear the term PM, which stands for particulate matter, and it's divided up into sizes. But what I'm particularly interested in my lab is the actual surface corona that it exists on these particles. And that's because when the fossil fuels burn, all the chemicals in that fossil fuels can adhere to the surface. And we know that the toxicity of that, that, um, that surface corona is really heavily implicated in um, impacts on health. And in particular, um, I'm interested in the organic carbon species that are on the surface of these compounds. And these are polyaromatic hydrocarbons, and they're described as compounds that contain two or more fused benzene rings. So here's our benzene rings. And this is the compound that I've been most interested in, in the last 10 years. It's phenanthrin. It's a three-ringed polyaromatic hydrocarbon. And the reason why I'm so interested in phenanthrin is because it's the most abundant PAH in both the gas phase of air pollution and on the surface of PM. Now, how do we start to think about phenanthrin in the heart? Well, it's also the most abundant pollutant in crude oil. And that's really how I kind of came into this story. The idea of phenanthrin in the heart or its, its, um, its negative con uh, con consequences were really brought to light following two major devastating oil spills in the marine environment. The first was the Exxon Valdez, and this released um, crude oil into the pristine um, ecosystem of, uh, Alaska, of Alaska, and it polluted the spawning grounds of this little fellow, the Pacific herring. And so here you can see a happy Pacific herring developing embryo. But what um, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, led in large part by my friend and colleague, John and Cardona, noticed was that in the spawning grounds that were exposed to the Exxon Valdez crude oil, the herring weren't developing normally. They had this suite of, um, of, uh, cardio, or of a toxicity syndrome that comprised small eyes, a pericardial edema, and this body axis deformation. But in addition to that, they also noticed that there was something wrong with the hearts of these embryos exposed to this crude oil. The hearts didn't contract as well. They showed AV block, which is a block between the atria and the ventricles. So the atria would contract, but the ventricle wouldn't contract or the ventricle contract, but without the atria contracting first. And these are some of the common arrhythmias that they noticed in these developing fish after being exposed to the oil from the Exxon Valdez. And what was really important about John and Cardona's discoveries or uh, um, information was that he noticed that these cardiac dis dysfunctions preceded the developmental, developmental malformations associated with this toxicity syndrome, suggesting that something in the oil was directly impacting the heart. And when heart function was, dis was um, disrupted, development didn't continue, and the number of these fishes all died. And we know that oil was, is a complex mixture, but I've already told you the answer in that a, a series of studies showed that phenanthrin alone, a three um, ring polyaromatic hydrocarbon, could mimic the effects of crude oil on causing this developmental toxicity and these cardiac defects. So it seems like phenanthrin was a really important important, important, important um, part of the cardiovascular implications of crude oil. But to really understand the mechanisms of how phenanthrin was causing these um, changes in cardiac function, really waited until 20 years later, and another devastating oil spill hit the, um, the, the, the world. And that was the Deepwater Horizon oil spill that um, emptied almost more than 2 million, more than 6 million barrels of crude oil directly into the water column in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is actually kind of where I joined the story because colleagues of mine at Stanford University were part of a tagging project. We're tracking pelagic fish species, oops, sorry, we're tracking pelagic fish species um, up in the, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. So just to give you some orientation, that's Florida. Here's the Gulf of Mexico. There's um, the east coast of, of Canada and America. And these are important pelagic um, fishes, important for both recreational fishery and for um, uh, consumption, and also big indicators of, of, of aquatic health. And what we noticed when tracking this guy, the, bluefin tuna, the, the yellowfin tuna, 
was that these animals were sitting here in the Gulf of Mexico spawning at this time of year in 2010. And so they were actually in the Gulf of Mexico at the time that the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. There's the oil spill um, releasing all these quantities of crude into the aquatic environment. And so my colleagues in, in Stanford asked to bring a team from Manchester together to help to try and understand now what the mechanism of cardiac toxicity that we knew from the legacy of the Exxon de Valdez, how it was actually affecting the hearts of these important pelagic fishes. And because we wanted to look at mechanism, we decided to um, look at the level of the individual cardiac myocyte. And so what you can see here is a, let me see if I can get it to be, no, I can't get it to be. This is, this is, a, is a cardiac myocyte, and this is from a, a bluefin tuna. And you can see it's a long, thin cardiac muscle cell, a single muscle cell from the heart of one of these, these um, majestic fish. And this is a patch clamp pipette. And what this patch clamp pipette does is it allows us to, let me see if I can, uh, well, if I, if I just make it contract, what you see is you can actually get this single cell to contract and relax. And because we have a pipette on it, we can measure the ion currents that are causing that muscle cell to contract and relax. And in, as you think of the heart as a syncytium, it's all of these muscle cells working together. And the contraction relaxation of the whole heart, which drives blood flow around the body, either in development or in an adult life, um, is controlled by these ion currents moving across the cell membrane. And so we wanted to look at this level of, of, um, of function to try and understand the mechanism of the crude oil toxicity. And so what we did was we looked at the effects of phenanthrin on cardiomyocytes to try and understand how, what the mechanism driving the decreased pumping, the AV block and the arrhythmias that we saw in the embryonic fishes. So now I'm going to go to a little bit of, of, of um, cardiac physiology for you all. So take that cardiac myocyte that I showed you, that long, thin myocyte. This is a schematic of it now. And what you can see is that this is the, all that contraction relaxation is controlled by the flux of ions across the cell membrane. So you've got potassium fluxes, calcium fluxes, and these, these contractile components inside the cell causing it to contract when calcium is delivered. And so what we did was we added phenanthrin to our cells and we looked to see how these components were impacted. And if we first look at the action potential, which is the sum of all that electrical activity, what we noticed is that in black, we have our control action potential. So this is um, current flowing across the cell membrane. And you can see that as we added phenanthrin, the shape of that action potential changed. And importantly, what we saw was this prolongation of the action potential, the difference between this red line and this black line. And that prolongation is proarrhythmic. So to try and understand how that prolongation was occurring, we just looked specifically at ion flux through this channel, the potassium channel. And what you can see, this is actually a measure of the ions flowing across that membrane using that patch clamp technique. And here, this line here shows you the amount of potassium flowing through that membrane. This is important because it allows the heart cells to relax. And when we add phenanthrin, you can see that potassium flux is inhibited. That's causing this prolongation here and causing this prolongation phenotype. So because of this, we then know that phenanthrin was causing, it's inhibiting ion channels, prolongating action potentials and leading to a prolongation phenotype. And so that mechanism could explain what we saw in those, um, the, the failure of contraction in the hearts of those embryonic fissures. The next thing we want to look at was the failure of contractility. So not the electrical activity, but how the heart is actually shortening and contracting. And that's where calcium channels come in. Calcium comes into the cell. And this is an influx. Now, this downward deflection is calcium coming into the cell measured with electrophysiology. And you can see in this black line, lots of calcium coming in. But when we add phenanthrin, that calcium coming in is reduced. That slows the amount of calcium and reduces the amount of calcium coming in. And that will inhibit the contraction of the heart. So together from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and working with the individual myocytes of these, um, these fishes, we were able to basically show the mechanisms at the cellular level of why we are seeing decreased pumping and arrhythmias in the embryonic fishes. So we're starting to understand the cardiotoxic mechanisms of this crude oil. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here, but that was in the marine ecosystem. I had a fantastic PhD student working in my lab from Nigeria named Martins. 
And Martin decided to see whether or not we had the similar pro pro problems occurring with pollution in the freshwater system. And he used the iconic um, uh, brown trout, which is an animal that we love to have in our British waters. And we have the invasive crayfish, which is in our British waters, though we don't quite like love to have them, and showed that both freshwater invertebrates and freshwater vertebrate species also have the same impact of phenanthrin on the electrical properties, the calcium um, properties, and um, therefore showed reduction in contractility and arrhythmias in the hearts of these freshwater species too. And we propose that this impacts fitness of the animals in polluted streams. So I said I was gonna move from oil spills and fish to, to human health. So how do we make this leap? Well, this, this figure here shows the percentage of total PAHs measured in a certain um, volume. These are the range of different PAHs and their different um, uh, um, derivatives. And in purple, we have phenethrins and the um, uh, methylated phenethrins. And I've already told you that phenethrin was very prevalent in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and you can see it from these bars here. And phenethrin is also very highly prevalent in the freshwater urban streams. But now we move into air pollution. In urban air, in both the vapor and the particulate air, measured in China, in a city in China, you can see again, a high proportion of the pollutants of the PAHs are phenanthrin. Closer, a bit closer to home, this is in Greece, high levels of phenanthrin in urban air, both the vapor and particulate phase. And I told you that it was coming from the surface of the PM. So this is actually looking at taking just the actual, um, the particulate matter, and eluding the phenanthrin off the surface, eluding the, the corona off the surface. And you can still see there's a high amount of phenanthrin stuck to the PM, which would be contributing to the particulate part of the um, levels in these two figures. And so we started to say, okay, well, we know that phenanthrin is an, a, a ubiquitous part of crude oil, but it's also a ubiquitous component of air pollution. And so the question is the cardiotoxicity in fish following an oil spill, a warning for humans and our hearts in polluted air. And so to address that question, we moved out of the aquatic ecosystem and into what we call human relevant models. And so this involves um, zebrafish, so we're staying a little bit with the fish, but this is a, a human model of, of, of um, heart function. Working together with colleagues in, in cardiovascular group in Manchester, we worked on a large animal model, the sheep. And then with colleagues in Bristol, um, Jules Hancocks, we also developed um, work on human iPSCs. And now rather than being funded by the environment agencies, we're actually being supported by the British Heart Foundation. We're asking the very same questions. At the level of the cardiomyocyte across all these groups, it's the same ion channels and pumps that are working to control contraction and relaxation of the heart. So what we do, what I'm going to show you now is some of the key parts of the data from these different models to try and understand how, um, how we can take the information we learn from fish into this um, uh, terrestrial realm. So all the next few figures are gonna be kind of set up like this. I'm going to have a, a panel that shows the data from the fish, the data from the human iPSCs, and the data from the, um, the, the sheep. And I know not everybody here is electrophysiologist or cardiac physiologist, so I'm, I'm happy to discuss any of the details, but I'm just really gonna highlight the take home messages from this fairly comp um, I think comprehensive study. So looking across these three different model organisms, we looked at the impact of phenanthrin on the action potential. Remember that's the collective um, electrical activity of the cardiac myocytes. And what we saw was that in all cases, when getting black, we have the control. In all cases, phenanthrin shortened the action potential duration. This is opposite to what we saw in the marine fishes, but shortening of action potential duration similar to prolongation of action potential duration is also prolific. What's causing that shortening? Is it the potassium channels? Well, we looked here, these are, remember I showed you these, these figures before that this, this shows potassium flowing across the membrane in voltage clamped um, electrophysiological myocytes. And what you can see is in both the fish, the sheep, and in the human iPSCs, there's an inhibition of this potassium current following the application of phenanthrin. But there are species specific differences. The fish seems to be more sensitive than the sheep and the human iPSCs. So that's looking at the electrical activity. 
what about the calcium flux, that ion that's controlling the actual contraction function of the heart? So we looked at it at two levels. This is calcium flowing across the cell membrane. So remember I said inward flux is calcium coming in. And you can see in black, there's a nice amount of calcium coming across the cell membrane. That is reduced when we apply phenanthrin. And that's in both the uh, zebrafish and in the human IPSCs. But interestingly, in the sheep, phenanthrin had very little impact on the calcium flux across the cell membrane, even at the highest concentrations that we used in our study. There's another way of looking at calcium flux, and rather than measuring it flowing across the membrane, we can just look at the collective amount of calcium that's in the cell every time the cell contracts and relaxes, and that's called a cellular calcium transient. And that's what I'm showing in this figure for zebrafish, sheep, and for the human iPSCs. Each of these contractions and relaxations, there's calcium coming into the cell, the muscle contracting, causing the whole heart to contract, to pump blood around the body, relaxation for the next cycle to happen again. And what you can see is the intracellular calcium cycling is inhibited in all three models, but less so in the, the sheep and less so in the, um, I'm sorry, in the, in the fish and the IPSCs compared to the sheep. So, what are the conclusions from our human relevant models? Well, I think, in fact, there's remarkable similarity across all the species that we've looked at. So, inhibition of potassium fluxes in the cells inhibition of calcium fluxes in the cells and inhibition of intracellular calcium cycling together are causing electrical and conductive dysfunction. The relative contribution or the relative amount differs a little bit between our models, but in all cases, we have a depression of both the electrical activity, which is, caused, which is proarrhythmic, and a depression of contractile function, which means the heart will be a less effective pump. And it's interesting that whether we're looking at the freshwater zebrafish, the large mammal sheep, or this human um, cardiac myocyte model, this consistent, um, there's consistent um, uh, responses showing that phenanthrene is cardiotoxic. So the mechanisms that we revealed in the mammalian models concur with those from fish, and they also concur with epidemiological evidence that we know shows increased cardiac dysfunction in humans as particulate matter increases in, um, in our air from the combustion fossil fuels. So we've also looked at mouse, and I'm not going to talk about mouse today, but I wanted to put it up there to show that we've also used another model. But I guess kind of to summarize, we can say that human relative models um, are allowing us to understand the mechanisms um, of cardiac toxicity in relation to pronental. I've told you the main areas and the main parts of the mechanisms that are impacted by looking at the cellular level, we can build up to what's happening in the whole heart. And I think importantly for this talk, I think it's really interesting that coming from an environmental toxicology background and understanding what was happening in the marine and the freshwater environment has really allowed us to rapidly work through these, these human relevant um, models. And so we can now move hopefully to translating the impact in these model systems to what it actually means for human health. And our plan now is to move from these acute studies with direct exposure to these compounds to more prolonged studies where the route of uptake was more reflective of real host and environmental interactions, like aquatic exposure in fishes, inhalation in humans, and also testing the impact of having a pre-cardiac, pre-existing cardiac um, condition on the impact of this air pollution on human health. So I've told you the air pollution affects our health through affecting our hearts, and I said it was primarily through um, cardiovascular functions. And so I hope you can see the fossil fuel pollution impacts the cellular processes that underlie the contraction and relaxation of our hearts and the hearts of the organisms that we share the planet with. So I'd like to um, end there by thanking you all for listening, thanking Martin, whose data I showed, Lottie and Shiva to collect the data on both the, the um, zebrafish, the sheep, and the human IPSCs. Mark Miller is my collaborator in, um, uh, in, in Edinburgh, who's been uh, intricately involved in this project. Gina Galli, Barbara Block, Fabian Brett, and Carolyn Cross, who were involved in all the work with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. John and Cardona and Alan Soros, who have um, a fantastic toxicologist to help us with all the aspects of this work. Jules Hancock, who um, has been working with me on the human IPSCs and really getting to even more detailed level of mechanistic understanding. And the Chocolate Deer Lab for providing the sheep model and the funders. And I'll take any questions. Thank you.
It's great, Holly. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, if you can put your uh, questions into the chat box, uh, we can address those. And I, I guess I first want to pick up on this issue of acute versus chronic in my, that's as much as I can say about medical stuff. Uh, because I, I guess there's maybe a presumption for me that thinking that these are all going to be chronic things and there's this buildup over time, but these are really acute effects which are happening really, really fast. Uh, and, and so what's your, what's your view in terms of like, is that the floor or are we overestimating those chronic effects? And are the concentrations you're looking at more in that acute range or is that more in that, oh, okay, we've got to build that up over time chronically? That was, that's an excellent question, Mike. And I think the first thing is, is to say that there are both acute and chronic effects affecting all populations, whether they're human or, or aquatic or, or, or whatnot. So the low level of consistent air pollution causes um, inflammation, it causes other kinds of aspects that cause poor health in general. And so there are um, there is a there is an overall impact. What we've looked at in these studies is the acute effect. So if you have a very high exposure, which is um, probably not going to be what you'd expect just living in a city, but occupational exposures, coal plant workers, people who work tar in the fields can have really high point exposures. And we also know that in days where, for example, I mean, it's fossil fuel burning, and I've obviously implicated humans, but in, when forest fires are burning and there's huge amounts of fossil fuels across the air, that's causing a huge impact on people's health. And that would be an example of an acute of response that could happen to a large population. And of course, from the fish's perspective, it's you know, being exposed to an oil spill. So I think that the, both of them are happening and both of them are really important. And I suppose that if you all already have a basal level of inflammation and dysfunction because of a low level um, area, then you already have a disease state upon which these acute dispenses can become even more um, problematic. And certainly that's what we know from hospital admissions that people who already have cardiac dysfunction, whether because of congenital disease or, or, or associated with air pollution are much more at risk in a spike situation than, um, than generally healthy population or people who don't live in a polluted area. Um, and in relation to concentrations you asked, um, the ones that we use here are high. So in human blood, in high in exposed areas, um, it's in the uh, very low micromolar range, high nanomolar range. But we did, so we're, we're, we're in the medium to low micromolar range. But one of the things about these pollutants is that they are lipophilic and they bioaccumulate in the body. And so in terms of environmental exposure or bioaccumulation, I think we're probably, at the mechanistic level, but we're applying it for short term, and we do have to move to lower levels and longer term to really kind of understand deeper these processes. And I guess it's also like, it, so the blood level might be low, but there might be part of the body where that is accumulating, like these, you know, stories about microplastics showing up in lung tissue and that stuff. So, absolutely. Right? And of course, microplastics are also a source for polyaromatic hydrocarbons sticking to the surface. So they're. Yeah, they're yeah. You can think of it as particulate matter or microplastics and nanoplastics. They're both the vehicles for these, these, these polyamidic hydrocarbons. Uh, so Amanda Bamford asks whether you have looked at recovery times. Yeah. So um, in, in these experiments, in the, the, in the mechanistic experiments, we can perform washout experiments. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, Amanda, but we can look at the inhibition of these ion channels and then look to see how it comes off. That helps us to understand the mechanism of the actual toxicity. Is it binding in a pocket where it's inhibiting that ion flow and will never come off? Or is it binding there for forever? And is it once it's, you're exposed, can you ever recover? So we can, I suppose from the potassium, from both works is partial, I think is the easiest way to say it. We can show partial recovery from the acute responses. That would suggest that there could be long-term recovery if humans are it exposed to high levels, but are relocated or air pollution gets better in certain areas. And I guess we, we have a, a wonderful historical evidence of that. If we think of the great smog in, in England and the number of people who died in relation to the terrible um, air quality in the 1950s, when the Clean Air Act came in and reduced pollution, the number of deaths reduced 
consistently. So we do know if you clean up the air, things can get better. So I guess that kind of fits into Lucian Wong's next question, which is talking about the molecular mechanism. So does that then apply, uh, sort of imply that this is reversible binding that is taking place? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. And that's where Jules Hancock's work has really come in and shed, a, shed light on the system. So he's looked at specifically at that potassium channel because the herb channel is like the key channel for all safety pharmacology. If you have a drug and it blocks that channel, there's no chance we'll ever get to, um, to, to, to market because it's pro-arrhythmic and obviously you don't want to have arrhythmias because those are fatal. And so testing of that herb channel are key. And because we showed the phenantrin blocked that herb channel, the ion flow through that potassium channel, um, it really interested Jules to see what the actual mechanism is. And so he did some site-directed mutagenesis of the pore of that ion channel and then docked phenanthrin molecules into that pore to see where it binds. And it is actually a direct binding to the channel. So it's a specific pore blocking channel binding, but it doesn't, it's not, it's not blocking at the canonical binding site that most other pro products do. So it is a direct block, but it's more unusual. In the case of the calcium, so that, that kind of explains the proarrhythmias. In the case of the calcium and the um, contractility, that's a really difficult question. We don't know the answer to it. One thought and one thing we're working on right now, I've got a, 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 a master's student, a PhD student who did some really nice work trying to see if reactive oxygen species, which we know is, um, increases in the heart in response to toxic exposure, is the link between the reduced calcium flux and the exposure. Because we don't think phenanthrin is binding to those calcium channels. We think that phenanthrin is causing something to happen inside of the cell, which is then having a knock-on effect on the calcium. So we're investigating ROS as a key mediator, but it could be pH, it could be many things. And so we don't have a mechanistic understanding of that right now. And I guess, I guess this sort of ties to another thing that I was thinking of, because if you have a model for the mechanism, well, then you could computationally quickly look at all of those different scary looking organic molecules that you had in the list, because that's, I mean, that's what I was thinking. I was like, that's an insane amount of work and you looked at one thing. And Absolutely. so to, to scale that up, that really has to include collaboration with the uh, sort of molecular modelers. Absolutely. And the docking work of, of um, Jules and his colleagues in Bristol have been really, really helpful, not just for the different rings, but each of the different um, components can be variably methylated and that impacts <laughs> its toxicity. So it's a, it's a long, and of course, every time you burn an engine slightly differently, the relative proportions of those yeah. change slightly differently. But we are getting a clearer picture. And so we do hope that eventually we'll understand where, which are the most cardiotoxic and then um, hopefully try and stop those ones from being produced when we burn fossil fuels. Yeah, well, we should stop all of them being produced. Probably not. <laughs> At least know what ones to worry the most about. Uh, so Sammy asks the question, uh, have there been many in vivo studies within humans, per, per, perhaps posthumously, that can compare to the human IPSC studies? Perhaps it will be in small study numbers. But... That's a great question. So um, there haven't been direct ex that very many direct exposure studies, on partly because what we're doing here is looking at um, we need to take the heart out and digest it into individual cells to actually study it at this level of toxicity, which not many human volunteers would put themselves up for. But certainly other aspects of air pollution um, toxicity have been looked at in terms of how it, um, inhalation to pollution affects things like blood pressure, vasodilation, um, VO2, and all the kind of the higher level performance mechanisms that reduced cardiac function would provide have been investigated in, in direct studies in human populations, but um, then also I suppose in epidemiological evidence linking those two. There have been mouse um, studies of direct exposure um, to mice and putting them in, in chambers with, with smoke, so to speak, um, for little critters, but, um, and then therefore, and, pe and people have looked at the longer term effects based on, on those kinds of studies, but we haven't got that same data for for humans yet, no. I, I know nothing about this, but it feels like heart transplant 
uh, might be an interesting way to look at that and whether or not there's sort of any historical, because we did some brain stuff a long time ago and there's sort of these really interesting banks of cells that you can get access to and whether that could then be tied to the reason that that person needed a heart transplant would be neat. That would be, that would be fantastic. I suppose in that case, we'd be kind of looking at the metabolites because once phenanthrin gets into the body, yeah, yeah, yeah. the body metabolizes it, but there are a suite of, of metabolites that are used in occupational health to understand exposure. So people working at airports who are inhaling fumes or people who are working in, in, um, in certain factories where you're, there is a lot of PAH produced, um, that, that, that type of work can go on, so. Fantastic. Okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, Claudia and Holly, for uh, your super interesting and, uh, as I love about these seminar series, super different talks. Um, <laughs> it just really highlights uh, how exceptional we are uh, across the board in terms of sustainability. Uh, has certainly given me a lot to think about. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for for attending. Um, and please join us in the future. And Sign up for the Sustainable Futures mailing list if you can. Great. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.